Hello, I am Kyle Claridge, and I'm a cardiologist here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine. And I'm here today with you for our interview with the expert series. Today, it's my great pleasure to have Dr. Hilary Dubrock, a pulmonologist from Mayo Clinic Rochester campus also, here to talk with us about when we should consider the referral to the pulmonary hypertension clinic or a specialist with, pul with a background in pulmonary hypertension. Welcome, Hillary, and thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to discuss this important topic. Thank so you for having me. You are absolutely welcome. It's great. Uh, so when, you know, as a clinician, uh, we may get a report back uh, from, say, the ED, a CT scan, or maybe an echocardiogram that makes us wonder, or maybe it's symptoms. When should clinicians suspect the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension? So oh, um, I think that's an excellent question. I think, you know, before we talk about when to suspect a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension, it's really important to think about how we define pulmonary hypertension in the first place. So pulmonary hypertension is a clinical and a hemodynamic diagnosis. So we define it actually as an elevated mean pulmonary artery pressure greater than 20 on right heart catheterization. And it can be due to varied causes in elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, which we refer to as pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension an elevated pulmonary artery wedge pressure, which we refer to as post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, or an elevated cardiac output or a combination of factors. We further classify pulmonary hypertension into five different groups that have different treatment implications, according to the Sixth World Symposium on Pulmonary Hypertension. And so group one refers to pulmonary arterial hypertension, which includes idiopathic pH, heritable pulmonary hypertension, drug and toxin-induced pH, and then pulmonary hypertension associated with different conditions like congenital heart disease, connective tissue disease, portal hypertension, H or NHIV. Group two pulmonary hypertension refers to pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease. Group three refers to pH associated with lung disease or hypoxia. And group four refers to chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension caused by chronic blood clots within the pulmonary vessels. And group five refers to pH associated with varied conditions like chronic kidney disease and myeloproliferative disorders and sarcoidosis. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, or that group one pH, is rare with a prevalence of six to 26 cases per million, but pulmonary hypertension, that umbrella term that refers to all causes of an elevated mean pulmonary artery pressure, is actually relatively common and affects about 1% of the population and 10% of patients greater than 65 years of age. And so to get to your question, clinicians should really suspect a diagnosis of pH in patients who have symptoms that are consistent with pulmonary hypertension. These include symptoms of progressive dyspnea, typically with exertion, but sometimes even at rest, and symptoms of decreased exercise tolerance without alternative explanations. Other symptoms include fatigue, chest pain, and palpitations, as well as symptoms of right heart failure, like lower extremity edema, abdominal distension, and exertional presyncope or syncope. Physical examination findings that should prompt suspicion of pH include an elevated jugular venous pressure, a murmur of tricuspid regurgitation, a prominent P2, or a lower extremity edema. Unfortunately, the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension are nonspecific, so delays in diagnosis of up to two years are actually quite common. And because of this, it's really important to maintain a high index of suspicion, even though the disease is relatively rare, in order to minimize these diagnostic delays, since some forms of pulmonary hypertension, such as pulmonary arterial hypertension and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, are treatable diseases. You know, you mentioned early on that it's based on a right heart cath pressure. Does, do you have to have a right heart cath to make that diagnosis? Right heart catheterization is really mandatory for diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And it also helps us with classification. Some of the screening tests like echocardiogram can help determine the probability of pulmonary hypertension. And certainly based on echo or CT scan, you can say that a patient has a high probability of pH but you wouldn't necessarily give them a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension without that right heart catheterization. So if you got an echocardiogram that suggests the pressures are in the 60s or 70s, you would then take that patient and they have symptoms and other clinical indicators, you would take that patient to a right heart cath and, and, and make sure that that's the case. As we know, sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and then after we've made the diagnosis, um, what kind of workup are you going to do for that patient? Beyond, or, or do you have a workup that you need to do before you even get to the right heart catheterization? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so in the initial workup of suspected pulmonary hypertension, you know, if you just have your history and physical exam to start with, then 
The next most important test that would give you an idea about whether someone has pulmonary hypertension is a chest X-ray, electrocardiogram, and echocardiogram. And these tests are helpful not only to help with screening for pulmonary hypertension and help determine that probability of pH, but can also give you insight into other etiologies of the patient's symptoms of dyspnea or other um, you know, fatigue or other findings. On ECG, you can see findings of right-sided chamber enlargement or right bundle branch block. On chest X-ray, you can see enlarged pulmonary arteries. You might notice that there's loss of the retrosternal airspace due to right ventricular enlargement, or you could potentially find you know, emphysema or interstitial lung disease, which we know are also associated with pulmonary hypertension. Echocardiogram is generally the preferred screening test for pH, and there's several different echocardiographic findings that can help you with determining the probability of pH. For example, a tricuspid regurgitation velocity greater than 2.8 meters per second, a right atrial or right ventricular enlargement, right ventricular dysfunction, increased pulmonary artery diameter, and flattening of the intraventricular septum can all be clues associated with an increased probability of pH, while patients who lack these findings have a low probability of having pulmonary hypertension. There are guidelines that are published that can help you with determining the probability of pulmonary hypertension as well, um, which are shown in my slide. The, this slide basically illustrates the approach to evaluation of patients with suspected pulmonary hypertension, as well as the echocardiographic probability of pulmonary hypertension in symptomatic patients who have a suspicion of pH. And so, you know, as I mentioned, you want to start to see if the patient has history, symptoms, signs, or laboratory tests suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. And I didn't specifically mention laboratory tests, but things like an elevated NT pro BNP, for example, um, can give you insights into a possible pulmonary hypertension. You would then determine the echocardiographic probability of pulmonary hypertension um, in patients who are symptomatic. And this slide here, um, the figure here shows how you can determine that. So as I mentioned, you use the peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity, as well as these other echocardiographic signs of pulmonary hypertension to determine whether a patient has low, intermediate, or high probability of pH. In patients who have a low probability of pulmonary hypertension, then you really wanna consider other causes for their symptoms and or just follow up of these patients with you know, maybe a subsequent echocardiogram in six to 12 months. In patients who have a high intermediate probability of pulmonary hypertension on echocardiogram, then you want to fast track refer some of these patients, certainly those who have um, symptoms of severe pulmonary hypertension, like shortness of breath at rest, or exertional syncope, or right heart failure, and patients who have known you know, risk factors for pulmonary arterial hypertension, like connective tissue disease, or patients who have chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension as well. Um, in patients who you're not fast track referring, you know, in the meantime, while you're waiting for your referral to pulmonary hypertension specialist, you can consider a VQ scan, which is a really helpful test to screen for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. You want to also consider left heart disease and assess the pretrest probability, which you can use, you know, just looking at do they have valvular disease, do they have, you know, risk factors for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and also assess the pretest probability of lung disease. Do they have known interstitial lung disease or severe COPD? So those patients, you know, the mainstay of treatment is really treating the underlying disease for the most part. And so you wanna do that first. And then for patients who don't have clinically significant left heart or lung disease, then you'll be referring those patients to an expert pulmonary hypertension specialist or anyone who has an abnormal VQ scan as part of their workup as well. Well, that's a very helpful algorithm. And thank you for walking us through it so thoroughly. I think even people who couldn't see their screen if they were otherwise uh, driving or exercising or whatever it might be <laughs> could uh, understand that. And I think just to summarize, if you have a patient with signs and symptoms of, of pH um, plus some laboratory tests, the next steps would be to get that chest X-ray, EKG, and echocardiogram that would then allow you to risk stratify and whether you need to fast track them to a pulmonary hypertension referral or whether you can start working through sort of underlying causes of disease uh, as per your algorithm. So that was very helpful. Thank you. I um, you know, wonder if uh, there was any, um, anything else that you wanted to leave our, our, our conversation with, any teaching points or important lessons from your vast clinical practice mm -hmm. that you've seen mistakes people make or things that you know, we should be aware of as cardiologists, internists, family physicians that, you know, we don't want to fall into that, those uh, pitfalls. Yeah, sure. So I think um, I probably have two main points. One, 
Um, you know, a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension has significant implications for patients. When they're told they have pulmonary hypertension, they often go home and read that they have two years to live. And, um, you know, it's very, you know, disturbing and difficult for them. And so I think be careful about how you phrase telling patients whether they have pulmonary hypertension, particularly if they haven't had a thorough workup, um, including the right heart catheterization and looking for the classification of pulmonary hypertension. Um, so that's one thing that I think is really important. And the second thing I think is just to remember to think about it um, because, because of these delays in diagnosis, patients are often diagnosed at a very advanced stage of their disease. They've often seen multiple specialists prior to making it to a pulmonary hypertension clinician. And so really, you know, having that high index of suspicion to think about patients with pulmonary hypertension um, as a potential cause of their exertional dyspnea or their symptoms um, in order to make that diagnosis sooner is, is really important. Yeah, that's great. I think one of the other things that we struggle with too is um, cardiologists a lot and probably many of our colleagues and other subspecialties is that we see elevated pressure, say on an echocardiogram and maybe they've got some element of diastolic dysfunction or what we now call heart failure or preserved ejection fraction, or maybe they've got valvular heart disease. And I'm sure there's a certain subset of patients that not, you know, it's nice to think about the World Health Organization classifications of <laughs> hypertension, but there may be patients that are kind of straddling one or two of those and have mixed pictures. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And so we actually are seeing that it feels like more and more commonly where patients have what we call kind of group 10 pulmonary hypertension. They just have a mix of all different disorders. They've got, you know, chronic kidney disease and they've got an abnormal VQ scan and chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and a little bit of HEFPEF or scleroderma or, and it tends sleep to be apnea. Like, it seems yeah, like sleep <laughs> apnea. So, you know, what we try to approach it by treating kind of one thing at a time. So in patients, for example, who, you know, have you know, exertional desaturation or hypoxia or sleep disordered breathing, I think treating those things are really important. Um, and that can be done before they're referred to pulmonary hypertension clinic, because we know that those can worsen pulmonary hypertension. And then, you know, looking for these treatable causes, like do they have connective tissue disease or associated conditions, or do they have um, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension? So when I see someone with, you know, a, you know severe mitral regurgitation or a valvular disease, and they also have pulmonary hypertension, which I think might be disproportionate. I'll tend to do that workup without necessarily you know, moving on to the right heart catheterization if I think there's an alternative etiology um, and particularly getting the VQ scan again, just to make sure I'm not missing a treatable form of pulmonary hypertension. That's a great, um, really great hints. And I, the only question I have, and this comes up in my day-to-day -day practice uh, is, you know, that, that word that you use disproportionate, like how do I know how much pulmonary hypertension should be attributable to sleep apnea or to mitral regurgitation um, or to, you know, have tough, is, is there a guideline that we can use or is that just sort of one of those really gray areas? <laughs> it's definitely a gray area. And so I tend to think of, you know, a right ventricular systolic pressure greater than 50 on your echocardiogram or anyone with moderate to severe RV dysfunction, um, it's worthwhile to send those patients to a pulmonary hypertension clinic just to make sure that there's not an alternative form of pulmonary hypertension that would require some specialized therapy. And so those, those patients, I think, you know, warrant evaluation, even if they also have known left heart disease. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because these are very, especially when they get to that, what do you call it, group 10, <laughs> when they yeah. get to that group, it usually takes a village to manage these patients and a good discussion and a team approach to their care. And I think you've given us some very nice guidelines to think about when to refer patients. So when we see patients with elevated pressures on echo symptoms and chest x-ray abnormalities, we should probably start to think about pH clinic. And if, if we don't necessarily refer, we can always pick up the phone and call mm -hmm. and or find out whether we th you think that we should refer a patient. So I think that's another opportunity. So thank you very much for your time. Is there any other, uh, any other points that you wanted to make or anything else that we should leave our audience with as an exiting thought? You know, consider pulmonary hypertension in your evaluation of patients with unexplained dyspnea and, you know, getting that chest x-ray, electrocardiogram and echocardiogram can really help you help you with diagnosing and well, not diagnosing, but at least screening for pulmonary hypertension. And if that pressure is more than 50 uh, systolic pressure on the echo, estimated systolic pressure by echo, it's probably time to get the pH clinic involved. 
exactly. <laughs> All right, great. Well, thank you, Hillary, for your time and uh, your expertise and wonderful care of our patients. And thank you for imparting this knowledge to the interviews with the experts series at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Have a good thank day. Thank you. <laughs>